What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Week two of preseason officially in the books. So we're going to wrap that shit up like a Trojan and recap everything that's happened. The biggest takeaways, usage totals, stats, analysis, players, ADP, risers, and fallers. Week two NFL preseason. Before we start, though, I want to hear what some of your guys' biggest takeaways from week two uh, of the preseason was because there are 32 teams, 16 games being played. I can't possibly see everything. I can't cover everything. Um, so I, I appreciate when you guys drop comments below that maybe I've missed. So before we start the video, I want you to head to the comment section drop a comment below let me know what your biggest takeaways from week two of the preseason game was while you're down there i appreciate if you give a thumbs up to this video because i work very hard and that is a way of you showing me you appreciate my hard work because i appreciate every one of you guys that supports me and drops a comment down below so do that if you're new to the channel make sure you sub Subscribe because we're doing videos like this all NFL season season long. If you're listening via podcast, make sure you give me a rating and review. I would very much appreciate that. And that's really it. So we're going to do the week two recap today. Tomorrow will be top players to avoid video wide receivers. Thursday will be my favorite spot to draft from in your fantasy football league this year. Friday will be my wide receiver rankings by tier video. Um, I think you guys will really like that one. I get pretty in-depth. Saturday will be the E-Town Get Down, my big money league that I know you, a lot of you guys follow. We did the league meeting and the league punishment this previous weekend, so I made a video of it. That will be dropping Saturday. Sunday is my live streams, of course, so make sure you got that notification bell underneath the video. Just hit that bell, and you'll be notified anytime I go live, which is usually Sunday afternoons. I apologize for missing the last couple weeks, but we're in full go mode now, baby. You won't see me miss another live stream. Till then, uh, this upcoming weekend is my official live draft in New York City. So, of course, uh, nine of my subscribers are coming out to New York City from all over the country. This is so dope that you guys wanted to participate in this. We're going to hang out Friday to Sunday. I'm going to vlog the entire thing. We have a live draft on Saturday, and I'll show you guys the vlog once it's out probably next week. Super excited for that. So I'm getting all these videos done today. Anyways, week two recap. Let's get it. All the notes and stuff I take throughout when I do these recaps are on my website. So if you want to head over to bigdogsfantasy.com, head over to the blog section on the top, you will see these blog posts. Basically, it's all the chicken scratch that I get ready for for the videos is on there. So I'm pretty much just going to be kind of reading off my notes as we go through the video. So just keep that in mind. Now, I went back and watched... I don't watch every single game that happens during the preseason, but Thursday night I went back and I watched and then I tweeted out some of my thoughts on them. So this is a thread that I tweeted out that I just kind of want to show you guys. And if you're listening via podcast, I put up a lot of pictures and images and graphs and stuff throughout these videos. So I would recommend you uh, watching on YouTube as well as via the podcast if you have time. Um, but first off, looking at New England versus Philadelphia, man, the New England offense is literally just a, a spinning wheel, and they just do it over and over and over again. They realize what they need to do in order to get the ball down the field. They just hammer you with short pass after short pass. That essentially is their running game for the most part. They understand that today's league is a passing game, and that's where you can take advantage of it, where a lot of teams like to pass, uh, run the ball on first down to try to establish the run. The Patriots understand that that's not how you win games. Um, with Brady in there, he played on 37 of their uh, snaps. So the first team had 37 plays. 26 of them were pass, 11 of them were runs. For this exact reason, just for the fact that all they do is pass the ball and Brady gets the ball in the end zone, more than anyone in the NFL, he is my quarterback too. In fantasy football, he has been all summer. It's not like I needed to see that to change him at all. Um, the other takeaway is Corey Clement did not play. Ajayi got a lot of the touches, but he looked okay, nothing spectacular, nothing jumped off the screen. He got blown up in pass protection, and I think this is where Corey Clement really separates himself. He was one of the higher-ranked pass protection running backs in the NFL last year per pro football focus. I think he was the second-highest-rated rookie running back, only behind Jamal Williams. Um, so that's a big part of the game where, obviously, they're going to want to have Clement on the field for that. So I think he takes a lot of the third-down snaps, a lot of the work in the passing game. So I'm still pretty... Um, sold on the idea that this will be a full running back by committee. I mean, Ajayi is obviously going to take the majority of the early down work, but I think Corey Clement will certainly be involved when he's back and he's healthy. He's dealing with like a lower lower body injury, but they said him and Aguilar are both day-to-day. -day. Neither of them played in this game. And moving on to Washington versus uh, the Jets. So Rob Kelly got the start here, um, and he was heavily used on the first drive. He had four carries as well as two targets, um, and, and these are big for two reasons. Two of the carries he got were inside the 10-yard line. So it doesn't seem like they want to use maybe some Ajay P. Ryan in the goal line or inside the 10 or whatever where the valuable rushes are for a guy like Rob Kelly. 
He also got two targets, which is good to see because you don't really consider him a guy that you would see in the passing game. Chris Thompson did not play, but these were pretty much early down targets. So, um, you know, those are the downs that Rob Kelly will play. Obviously, the ceiling is lowered when Chris Thompson is back into the game. I personally think Samaj P. Ryan is a more talented and more explosive back, although he didn't really look good last year. He was a stud in college, um, and I just think he had a lot working against him last year between the offensive line and a lot of other things. But P. Ryan ended up uh, suffering a minor ankle injury. So that's that's time in camp that he's going to miss out on. And you never, ever, ever want to miss time in camp. Valuable reps, first team reps, um, competing for a job, especially you know in the middle of the summer. So he's going to fall a little bit further down the depth chart. And clearly he already was because uh, Rob Kelly was the clear starter there, getting a ton of touches. The other guy I want to point out was Cam Sims. He's this kid who's 6'5", 215 pounds. He basically was making, the, he, he was like what Washington thought or wants Josh Doxson to be. Cam Sims was this, this huge target who was going up and grabbing balls out of defenders' faces and out of their hands and stuff like that, and he looked really good. I mean, I, I just want to throw him on the radar there because just, just give a shout-out to Cam Sims because I'm sure he watches my videos along with everybody else. So I wanted to let them uh, let y'all know he's maybe someone to keep on the radar because it's not like the wide receiver core in Washington. While they have a lot of like decent, solid pieces, uh, you know, it, you never know what could happen by the end of the year. So Cam Sims is a guy who really kind of made an impression when I was watching the tape. Pittsburgh versus Green Bay, I had a lot of takeaways from this game. A-Rod got smacked on his first throw. He got right back up. Um, no problems. Wasn't scared. Wasn't intimidated. And that's good coming off this collarbone surgery or this collarbone injury that cost him most of last year. Got right up. His next throw was a strike right to Devontae Adams on a slant up the middle. Good to see that he came back up with confidence and, and was able to just deliver a strike on the next play. In the red zone, man, I, this was a big takeaway for me. I was watching, I went back and watched the plays, and I was looking at Aaron Rodgers, like where he was looking on the field, what were his first reads, second reads, things like that. He stared at Devonta Adams on every red zone snap that they had. Um, and on that first drive, they were down in the red zone for a few different plays. And on every play, every snap, his first look was just at Adams to see what kind of coverage it was. Was he getting separation? Um, you know, all this stuff. And that is a big takeaway for me considering they're going to be in the red zone a lot. And they pass the ball in the red zone a ton, almost more than any team in the in the NFL when they're in the red zone and inside the 10-yard line, which I'll, I think I'll get into in a little bit. But basically, I think Adams is in for a monster touchdown year. Randall Cobb saw an end zone, end zone target inside the red zone. Last year, he had six red zone targets in total in 2017, and he had one on the first drive with Aaron Rodgers this year. So just another thing for Randall Cobb. He's clearly the wide receiver two there, um, and with Aaron Rodgers back there, he's going to get a lot of work in that, in that red zone area. So again, guys, Cobb is being super undervalued in fantasy football drafts. Running back situation in Green Bay. Jamal Williams ran with the starters. He was used heavily in the passing game and I noticed this I saw Graham Barfield tweet it out but I picked it up before um, I saw his tweet and I was looking at where Jamal Williams was because I wanted to see if they were splitting snaps between Williams and timeline and what was happening they they lined up Jamal Williams on the outside like as a wide receiver in the spread offense three separate times very very strong in pass protection um, he showed in this game and he was like I said the top ranked rookie in pass protection last year per PFF. He was also, I think, the fourth overall best running back in terms of pass blocking last year. So, uh, this is a guy, Jamal Williams, man. I have him pretty highly ranked compared to a lot of people, and I think that he has a really good chance to be the head of this running back by committee, um, even if it's even going to be that. Now, Ty Montgomery played a little bit, played uh, some after Jamal Williams, got almost all of the first team snaps with Aaron Rodgers. Jamal Williams did hurt his ankle a little bit, but it's supposed to be very, very, very minor. So it'll be out for a couple days, maybe a week tops. I'm not really worried about that um, whatsoever. They said it's a, a low ankle sprain, very minor. And uh, I, if this makes his ADP drop even further, I'm cool with that. So Williams is by far my favorite back to own in this backfield. I think a lot of the things that we saw in this preseason game are great. Him lining out wide, him uh, successful in pass protection, him getting carries. It's all good. The other takeaway, draft Mason Crosby. Guys, you want to draft a kicker in an offense that scores a lot of points and is in the red zone a lot. That is the Green Bay Packers. He looked good. He was kicking through the uprights. Um, the only one I would say to stay away from, you know, you want to draft one in a good offense is the Pittsburgh team because they go for two way too often. They go for it on fourth downs a lot as well. Um, so I'd stay away from Chris Boswell, I think, is the kicker in Pittsburgh right now. The other takeaway, obviously, is James Washington uh, was super impressive, and the touchdown catch he had was, like, incredible. However, he was playing with the second and third team, so I don't want to, like, go crazy about it. I also think the other takeaway here is this. Like, we see guys like James Washington obviously had a big game. He looked really, really good. He's still behind Brown. He's still behind Juju. He's still behind Le'Veon Bell in terms of the passing pecking order. Uh, so I'm not going crazy about James Washington. He's definitely a good late-round flyer because if anything happens to the wide receivers ahead of him on the depth chart, he, turn, <coughs> he turns into like a pretty, uh, a pretty solid wide receiver too in fantasy. However, this going along with Mike Williams, 
Now, I, I don't think I touch on Mike Williams in the rest of my notes, but he had that touchdown catch where he soared over the guy and caught the ball. Guys, we need to not confuse guys that make that play, a play like that, like one asset of their skill set, uh, with good wide receivers. Like, Mike Williams, of course, is very capable of making that play. That does not make him the next Keenan Allen in terms of a route runner or a guy that Phillip Rivers is going to target because Phillip Rivers didn't target him at all while he was in the while he was in the game. That, that target came... On, uh, with the second stringers, or maybe even the third stringers, I'm not sure, but Mike Williams didn't have a target really outside of that, and uh, I don't want you to get caught up with guys who are red zone weapons. Like, that's not good for fantasy, right? A guy like Josh Doxson, uh, Mike Williams, these guys haven't proved to be good all-around fantasy assets and wide receivers. Just because they're capable of making plays like that doesn't mean that's going to translate into fantasy numbers. So I'm not high on Mike Williams whatsoever, even though with that, you know, that play that happened. So saying Tom Brady is my favorite behind Aaron Rodgers, especially in six point per passing touchdown leagues. Vegas has him as the odds on favorite to lead the league in passing yards as well as passing touchdowns. If you want to talk about Jimmy Graham, he had that touchdown, of course. He had that one catch, but he was like the third read on that play. And it was Aaron Rodgers like scrambling out of the pocket, which of course can, can, can happen. But uh, that, that doesn't get me any higher on Jimmy Graham, who I'm not taking anywhere at his tight end five ADP. Moving over to Tyreek Hill. So he caught that deep bomb from Mahomes and then everyone kind of went nuts. And Tyreek Hill's a guy that I've been telling people to stay away from as he's going in like the top 35 picks. So he's going as a as a third round pick. And like, I don't, I mean, I understand that that looked like a great play. And I'm like, oh, the Mahomes-Hill connection is real. But you have to, like, it's not like we didn't know that those plays are gonna come, right? It's not like we didn't know that Mahomes and Hill are gonna, are gonna link up on deep plays often throughout the year. Uh, I just think that the overall volume won't be high enough for him to sustain like week over week volume. And that's not what I really want as if you go two running backs and then Tyree kills your wide receiver one, that's a lot of expectations for a guy who's probably going to be volatile week to week. So I still very bullish on not taking him in the top three rounds. I also want to share this tweet from Graham Barfield. The Chiefs first team offense ran 23 plays with Patrick Mahomes versus Atlanta. Sammy Watkins alignment on his 23 snaps was as follows. Ran out of the slot, 12 of 13, out wide, 11 of 23, uh, and was the X receiver on six of those. Last year, Watkins spent 70% of his routes outside in LA. Way more slot work is coming in KC. This is a positive thing, not a negative thing, guys, because if you believe that Watkins maybe isn't an elite wide receiver um, and maybe he can't gain that much separation, him in the slot and him moving around, which is lines up with the reports that we kind of heard all offseason about Watkins being moved around in this offense, that's a great thing. Now, obviously, we want to see that translate into production. He hasn't really, he got targeted three times in this game, um, but he hasn't really put up any numbers and you're seeing it with Hill, not Watkins. And that's going to that's gonna move the ADP, right? Hill's going to go up and Watkins is going to go down because we haven't seen the production, but I'm okay drafting Watkins at that lower ADP. Like I said, I think at the end of the year, we're going to see pretty similar statistics between these two wide receivers and Watkins is going to be a lot cheaper. So him moving around, I think is a great thing. And I think that's going to open up a lot more targets for him. Whereas last year, he was pretty much just like a, I don't want to say like a decoy. I'm a fan of them moving him around a lot. And I know Graham Barfield said like after this tweet, he was saying how that's, this is a very good thing for Watkins. So I agree with him um, in that sense. And uh, we'll talk about a running back here that I've also talked about tirelessly this summer. It's on Johnson of the Detroit Lions. Again, though, I want to reiterate this, guys. I always say this, like, you have to be realistic when you're drafting and when you're analyzing players. The question marks are still very much there. He was, again, for the second second week in a row, uh, the third running back into the game. Amir Abdul actually got the start. He played in five snaps. Theo Riddick was the second running back in. He got four snaps. Karyon Johnson uh, saw four snaps as well. Theo Riddick very involved in the passing game. He caught three balls for 50 yards, including, like, a big 45-yard pass. It's clear right now that they are looking to use a committee, at least to start the year. So you have to understand that. Like if you're picking Carryon Johnson in, you know, if you're if you're one of those people that are moving his ADP up to like the fifth round, I think you, you gotta hold your horses because the numbers so far are telling us that for right now, right, they're not saying that Carryon Johnson is the starter. They're not even starting him in the preseason game. Uh, look at wait for week three really to see the dress rehearsal and see you know maybe he moves up to being the uh, the starter in this game. We can kind of go from there, but as of right now, it's very risky to take Carryon Johnson in the fifth round of drafts because. Like we've said, I mean, the downside was always him ending up in a, in a running back committee. No, how, no matter how much you like the talent, like that's that's realistic about, that's literally what's happening in this Detroit offense. So uh, I just caution guys that are going a little too crazy on carry on Johnson, especially in redraft leagues. So just, just keep that in mind. Um, another running back, Carlos Hyde, balled out once again. He ran for 64 yards on nine carries. He went nuts on the first drive. I think he had 45 rushing yards on the first drive. He capped it off with a uh, with a touchdown. Of his 64 yards, 
60 of them came after contact. So that's always been a thing for Hyde, right? He's one of those bigger backs that kind of hits you and he can keep rumbling towards it, but he's looking like he's elusive. He's, um, you know, he, I guess he's pissed off and he's like, they draft Nick Chubb, they bring me in, like, what are we doing here? And he's kind of balled out this preseason, man. And uh, originally I had Carlos Hyde as one of my top busts listed in my draft guide. And uh, well, one, that was in the beginning of the summer when I first started writing it, his ADP was at like 50 or 55, which is insane. Last week or two weeks ago when I made my update in my draft guide, I took Carlos Hyde out of that spot because now he's going at pick, I think 98 overall, running back 38. And he's looking like Nick Chubb is the clear second early down back. Carlos Hyde clearly has that number one role, getting a ton of touches, getting a ton of work with the first team. Nick Chubb is a, is a far off second, and Duke Johnson's obviously going to be involved with the first team as well, but Carlos Hyde is becoming a value in drafts. And like I said, I took him out of my top bust section in my draft guide. I'm gonna plug my draft guide right now. If you want to see all of my top busts, my top sleepers, my top rankings, positional rankings by tiers, my must draft players, my BDGE draft guide Bible, which is like 8,000 words about how you should attack your, um, your draft and the strategy behind it, there's like 170 pages in this draft guide, all straight from the fingertips right here. Um, you can go check that out in the link down below. It'll say buy the draft guide, or you can just head over to bigdogsfantasy.com, head over to the shop section. It should be the first thing listed there. Uh, highly recommend that, though. It's like kind of the one-stop shop for everything you need for your fantasy football draft. So uh, go check out the draft guide. But yes, back to what I was saying, Hyde is becoming a nice um, mid to late round value in fantasy drafts. I'm not going to go and reach for him in like the fifth round or sixth round just because there is still competition there and Duke Johnson is going to be involved in the passing game but Hyde is surprised. We'll talk about the Miami versus Carolina game because these are two very intriguing fantasy running backs. We have Christian McCaffrey He's really shaping up to be the workhorse guys. He's looking like the bell cow in Carolina. He has handled 80% of the first team running back snaps as well as 83% of the first team running back touches. Obviously this weekend, which is going to shoot his ADP up, I've seen him drafted at like the 10 or 11 spot in, in drafts already. He broke off this huge 70 war, 71 yard run. He took that to the, to the crib for a tutty. Um, and now that is his second rushing touchdown of the preseason. And those big plays, a 71 yard run was something that he did not do at all last year in 2017. And, uh, now it's looking like, you know, he is an explosive playmaker, the guy that they drafted out of Stanford. Um, he finished the game 5 of 92 on the ground with a touchdown. He also caught four balls for 28 yards, and that's what makes him so valuable, obviously. He's such a big asset in that passing game for the Panthers. So if he has another game like this in Week 3, guys, and he dominates the touches, and C.J. Anderson, who came in, like, midway through the second quarter in this Week 2 preseason game, uh, McCaffrey should very much be – he's going he's gonna to end up moving into the back end of the first round of drafts. Uh, somewhere from like the 10 to 12 spot and should be considered no later than the 14th overall pick. Um, so I know I've, I've been pretty, let me, let me, let me say this part. I've been pretty anti Christian McCaffrey this summer. And the reason was I figured, or I thought, you know, my mistake that I thought CJ Anderson was going to be much more involved on this first team offense and get a lot of the running, a lot of the running values and the goal line carries. And that's been completely the opposite. So what I'm saying is like, you know, you have to, especially like when you go into the summer and there's running back by committees or there's question marks about usage, preseason is such a good uh, yard mark to tell you where coaches actually see their running backs, right? And we're seeing it now. So the best thing I can do is not to hang on to the fact that I was wrong about CJ Anderson is to give you completely unbiased. I have to imagine that nothing's happened up to this point and I have to give you completely unbiased analysis. And I'm telling you that yes, I was probably wrong about Christian McCaffrey and the amount of usage that CJ Anderson was going to see. So I am quickly gaining steam on Christian McCaffrey. That's my bad, y'all, if you all drafted and, and avoided McCaffrey because of me. I'm sorry, but this is the best analysis I could do. I take my opinions and then um, I see where uh, the flaws were and I see what happens in the preseason and then I kind of go from there. So it's it's possible C-Mac could be a league winner this year. He was a bell cow at Stanford, got a million touches there, and it looks like the Carolina Panthers are going to do that to him in 2018. So guys, do not do not be backing off of C, uh, C-Mac anymore, especially if we see him do this again in week three of the preseason. So I just wanted to get that piece out and we'll move on to the second running back in this game, which is Kenyon Drake. Another guy I've been fading all off season. Uh, and not because I think he's a bad back whatsoever, but because the situation is still murky in my opinion, though he did look very good in this one. Um, he ran the ball eight times for 54 yards. He also caught three passes. He turned like a beautiful backfield hit into, I think it was like a 30, yeah, 34 yard run. 
Um, so he was used as their feature back. He was used as their bell cow. However, uh, Frank Gore didn't play. Kalen Balaj didn't play in this one. He was out with a concussion. Uh, Frank Gore was just like a rest day because he's 58 years old. So uh, you don't want to have him in for preseason taking hits and whatnot. But we still don't know what the regular season split is going to be here uh, for Drake. And I'm still not completely sold that he's going to be the guy who gets all the goal line carries, that Balaj is not going to be involved in the passing game. It's still a bad offense. It's still a bad offensive line. And Kenyon Drake's draft price is still, it really hasn't moved. It's like 35, 36. So you're drafting him in the top three rounds. And in my opinion, from what we see, I hope Gore and I hope Balaj are back for week three so we can get more of a feel about how this, this running back split is. Um, but I am definitely not taking Drake as the 35th or 36th overall pick, guys, no matter how good he looked in this game. He is a guy, like, I, I might I might be completely wrong on Drake, um, but there's just too many question marks for me to feel confident about picking him. Um, so if he drops into, like, the fourth or fifth round in, in one of these bigger leagues, then I'm, I'm cool taking him there. The running back, David Johnson, is just an absolute animal. I'm actually thinking about moving him up to third in my rankings, possibly second. I think I'm going to move DJ up to third over Todd Gurley. Um, and depending on the severity of Zach Martin's knee injury out in Dallas, their guard, uh, I might move him ahead of Zeke because he's a big piece of their line. Uh, supposedly, though, Zach Martin, who left the game with a knee injury, it was just a hyperextension, and they think he could be ready for week one, which is huge because Zach Martin was literally the number one graded guard per PFF last year in the entire NFL. So he's a huge piece of this offense. Um, but he's expected to be back for week one, which is really good news for Zeke owners. So if Zach Martin is back, um, Zeke will stay ahead of DJ there, but DJ is, man, I, I guess I just needed to see him play again and see him do his thing. He has looked so good this preseason, and I don't even think it matters that the Cardinals' O-line is bad or that their offense might be that good, might not be that good, but he is a, he is a savage. Um, Taewon Taylor, man, Taewon Taylor. I've talked about him a few times this summer, man, and I was telling people to draft him in Dynasty Leagues last summer, and uh, I got lucky, I guess, that he's kind of hit this this preseason, but he needs to be firmly on your draft radar right now. He blew by the Bucks defense. I don't know if you watched the highlights of him, but uh, he had like a screen or like a short pass that he just absolutely blew past his Bucks defense for like a 45-yard touchdown. He would finish the day four for 95 and two scores. Um, we still have no idea what's going on with Rashard Matthews. We have gotten no no reasonable explanation why he's not playing right now. Um, and he's missed all of preseason. He's missed all of camp pretty much, not practicing or anything, which is huge considering it's a completely new offense in Tennessee than what he learned last year. So, Taewon Taylor is a guy who has been playing wide receiver one reps while Corey Davis was out, he was like the wide receiver one. Um, and then if Corey Davis is back in, he's playing on two wide receiver sets. He's playing out of the slot on three wide receiver sets. So he's on the field. He's an every down player right now. And Taewon Taylor is showing that he is super talented um, and that he can absolutely be a big part of this offense. And all the beat reporters are saying that Taewon Taylor has been exploding. He's been one of the bright spots of this Titans offense. So Taewon Taylor is a late round guy that I absolutely love for a, a second year breakout player. And let's see, Jameis Winston. Uh, talking about the Bucks, played a lot of this game, and he put up numbers that we should have already expected him to put up because this is who he is. Uh, 13 for 18 in 226 yards and two scores. One of them being to Chris Godwin, my boy, one of my favorite late round picks. Um, but, but to that point, Deshaun Jackson is very much still a thing. He had a pretty good game. And I think a lot of things also broke wrong for Deshaun Jackson last year, whereas I see him having like a somewhat strong bounce back. Not like I'm not drafting him in fantasy drafts, DJX, definitely not, but I, I think that he is going to be a better real life player this year for the Bucs than he was last year. So I am going to not, I mean, I'm not, I'm not stopping the hype train on Chris Godwin because he's still a, like a double digit round pick, like 110th to 125th overall. So you're not really using a ton of draft capital on him, but we're seeing all of these Bucks wide receivers used in like a tandem between Humphreys and DJX and Chris Godwin. Um, so I think the only part of this passing game that I want inside single digit rounds is, is Mike Evans obviously he was like a third round ADP right now um, but there's just too much uncertainty especially with Winston missing the first three games however dude speaking of the Bucks also uh, before we talk about my favorite rookie running back Ronald Jones we're gonna thank today's sponsors for the video fantasyjocks.com y'all already know the move the number one industry leader in your league's fantasy gear championship belts championship rings Live draft boards for your draft. Talk about trophies. Like, they got Lombardi trophies. And you can get the team's names engraved on the plaques, guys. So you can you can take care of the winners. Winners win, losers lose. They also have options to buy uh, for people that lose in your fantasy league. They have little princess things. They got um, license plate stickers or license plate license plate covers that say, like, fantasy loser on them. They also have their draft board kits. Guys, you can get quick, I think, two-day shipping 
if your draft is coming up in the next week or so. The draft board kits come with the live draft, of course, it's the player stickers. It comes with koozies for your teams that uh, you can write the name, the team names on them. It comes with. Uh, <laughs> let me grab something real quick, actually, that we have. They come with a penalty flag because, you know, during live drafts, you don't want to be the guy who's like, oh, you're at two minutes, your pick is up. But, like, this is a way that I'm just going to throw this shit at my friends' heads when they take too long. But the draft board kits are, are very, very cool. Um, there's ones that have championship belts in them as well. So they're very varying, I guess. There's three different draft board kits you can get based on price and based on what you guys want for your league. But highly recommend you check them out, fantasyjocks.com. Use promo code TAKE10 or TACOCORP, T-A-C-O-C-O-R-P, for 10% off your purchase. Have everyone chip in, five, seven, nine bucks. Um, with the league buy-in and you're set to, to grab that stuff. So get that, get expedited shipping and you'll be ready for your draft. Thank you, Fantasy Jocks, for sponsoring today's video. Um, and now we move back to Ronald Jones. Well, Peyton Barber dominated this backfield once again. Rushed six times for 32 yards. He caught a pass. Rojo ran four times for two yards and now has more rushing yards or more rushes, more rushing attempts this preseason than rushing yards. Uh, the only target he got in this game, he once again could not come up with and dropped it. So now he has two passes in which he has dropped so far this preseason. It's a horrible, horrible start to the Rojo's preseason. Um, and Barber is quietly pulling a ro pulling away with the starting job and a monster role in this offense. Uh, Dirk Cutter came out today, I'm filming this on Tuesday, and said that Barber is a starter. We feel comfortable giving him 20 touches a game, and that is something that you absolutely want to hear uh, as a Barber owner. I just I just draft uh, got him in like the ninth round of one of my redraft leagues. It was 14 team league, so I got him at pick like 115. I was super pumped about that. Barber is now pretty much, I think he warrants like seventh round draft capital. Um, seventh, maybe eighth round, because people aren't going to be picking him that high, so you don't actually have to pick him that high. But wherever Rojo is going, Barber should be there. And I thought this was a funny tweet from Addison Hayes. Excuse me. He just said, I have seen enough. And he put the box score from the running backs in Tampa Bay. And it's, it's showing up all Barber. Um, and Addison Hayes is actually a guy who's going to be coming on my channel soon as one of the fantasy football industry behind the scenes videos. He is the creator of uh, ffstatistics.com. I highly recommend you check out that website. A very cool free resource where you can look at like um, coaching history and like fantasy finishes based on whoever was the coach or the offensive coordinator. Uh, a bunch with a bunch of other cool features on ffstatistics.com. So go follow Addison Hayes as well on Twitter. I think his name is at amaze underscore Hayes. H A Y E S. Um, and Tampa Bay. Oh, yeah. So I do actually have it written down here. So Jameis Winston, um, he's going to be undrafted in a ton of leagues. Their first three games are at New Orleans, Philadelphia versus Pittsburgh. Was not a great slate, anyways. He probably would have struggled, to be honest with you, statistically. And then you look at someone like Big Ben, who you can get at QB 10 or QB 12. He has a great early season schedule. He starts off with Cleveland, KC, Tampa Bay, all horrible pass defenses, uh, which is fantastic. So um, you can you can grab Big Ben and then grab Jameis Winston in the last round of your drafts if you want to pair them two. Or if you want to spend literally zero draft capital on the quarterback position, you can grab Alex Smith, who starts off with Arizona, Indy, Green Bay. And then, of course, you can plug Winston uh, in there later. But that's just a little tip and or trick for you. And then we move on to a tight end. Someone that I've been kind of low on. Trey Burton, Trey Boo Boo, as fantasy footballers like to call him. Might be taking a little bit of an L on this one. Well, not an L, but I need to be a little bit higher on him. Uh, they're literally just using him as a big wide receiver. Like, he's not really a tight end. And what they've been doing is using Adam Sheehan as, like, the main tight end in this offense. And they're using Trey Burton out of the slot, lined up outside in, like, the majority of his snaps, which is pretty crazy. But Adam Sheehan left with what appeared to be a serious ankle injury at first, However, we figured out since then that it's just a low uh, ankle sprain, and they're saying that he might be ready for week one. It's kind of an outside chance, I believe they said, that he's ready for week one. So we'll have to see what happens there. Sheehan and, and Trey Burton play completely different positions in Matt Nagy's offense in Chicago right now. So it's not really like if Sheehan were to miss time, it's not a huge upgrade to Trey Burton. However, the argument I made against Trey Burton was that, like, for one, I don't see Trubisky, like, you're betting a lot on Trubisky being a really good quarterback. Um, and it's possible that this offense itself just, you know, creates Trubisky being a good quarterback, just like the way uh, McVay's offense made Jared Goff uh, look like a 27 touchdown pass season last year was very, very high for Goff in terms of like who he really is as a quarterback, considering he led the NFL in most passing touchdowns that came from behind the line of scrimmage. So he was getting a lot of his um, production from the players that actually made the plays, not him being a quarterback, but that's what happens when you're in these good offensive schemes like Matt Nagy's bringing to Chicago. If she and misses time, right, my, my big concern was that, like, Trubisky, one, needs to be good. Two, Trey Burton needs to have such a high touchdown um, 
share in this offense, right? If Trubisky throws 20 touchdowns, Trey Burton, in order to be like a top eight or top six tight end, is probably going to need to catch 25, 30% of Trubisky's touchdowns. I wasn't sure about that. But if Sheen misses time, then they might move him over to that tight end spot where Sheehan was uh, so good at catching touchdowns and he was such a big target. So that could be an upgrade for Burton. He's someone that I'm probably going to be moving ahead in my rankings. I'll probably move him ahead of Jimmy Graham, possibly George Kittle because of his injury, and possibly even Kyle Rudolph, um, depending on what we see in week three. But Trey Burton has looked as good as advertised for the people that have been high on him thus far. Now we move over to Denver with Case Keenum targeting Emmanuel Sanders on six of his 13 throws. Y'all know I love Manny Sanders this year. Um, what's even better is that Sanders was running a ton of his routes from the slot. And I absolutely love that. One, because, you know, when you're getting older, you need to be able to move around the formation and run from the slot because when you're in the slot, you have a lot more separation between you and the defender than compared to on the outside. So even if you are a little worse at creating separation, the slot by default gives you more separation. Second thing is Case Keenum obviously loves throwing to the slot, which we saw in this preseason game, as well as we saw last year when Adam Thielen averaged almost nine targets a game running from the slot with Minnesota and Case Keenum there. Um, so I absolutely love Sanders. He also missed Sanders on a wide open 18 yard touchdown throw, uh, which would have, thank, I'm actually glad he missed that because a lot of people probably won't be looking uh, at like the actual usage statistics to look at box scores and just see Sanders caught like three of six or three of seven targets. Had he caught a touchdown, then people would be like, oh, Sanders looks good. But he missed just for you, for you guys to know that Keenum missed Sanders on a wide open 18 yard touchdown. Um, the other thing to say is though, Demarius Thomas did not play. I'm not really sure what's going on. He, he left Thursday's practice with a wrist injury. We haven't really gotten any updates on it, but I'm going to assume until we hear anything that it's not a serious injury and he'll be fine for week one. The other thing I think you want to take away from this passing game is their backup, Chad Kelly. Kelly was a guy who um, was good in college. Then he had he got like, I forget the backstory, but he got like kicked out of the school, then he had to go to a JUCO school where he absolutely dominated, then eventually transferred to Ole Miss after he had that one season in JUCO, played really well, then got hurt last year, um, or hurt prior to the 2017 draft. Um, had he not been hurt, apparently he was a, a very good talent, um, but now he looks really good in the preseason. So it's not like I don't think he's going to win the starting job, but for guys in two quarterback leagues, deeper rosters, dynasty leagues, Chad Kelly is definitely a guy to uh, keep an eye on there because he's looked very, very good in the preseason so far. Um, and then you have the running back battle here in Denver, of course, that has piqued everyone's interest in the fantasy football world. We got Royce Freeman and Devontae Booker. For the second straight week, we've had a complete split in terms of snaps and touches. Um, however, Freeman has outperformed Booker basically in, a, in an efficiency manner as well as scoring, of course. They both received, again, 10 snaps with the first team each. So Booker got 10 snaps. Freeman got 10 snaps. Booker was actually the starter. He ran for 17 yards on four carries, over 4.0 yards per carry, and he caught one pass for 10 yards. Freeman rushed the ball six times for 20 yards, so a little bit over three yards a carry, um, but he did have a four-yard rushing touchdown. He also caught a pass for six yards. So again, we're seeing a near-even split. We're seeing a near-even touch, uh, touch split as well as just overall snaps on the field. Um, both have been used plenty on the ground and as well through the air. Freeman has two touchdowns through two games so far, and it's looking like he's going to be the goal line back here, which isn't, I mean, surprising considering he looks like Jerome Bettis ate Jerome Bettis. So Freeman's a guy who's big. He's like a bowling ball, and he's going to get those goal line carries. I'm not surprised about that. But like I've been saying all offseason, guys, I am perfectly fine drafting both of these guys on your team considering where they're being picked as a value, although Freeman's price is rising very quickly through the preseason. And I think I've seen him go as early as the fourth round in drafts, uh, which is probably a little too high for me, to be honest. Uh, I mean, if it's in a 12-team league and it's like the back half of the fourth round, then I'm okay with that. But I'm not like going to start picking him in the 30s or anything like that, just because like we're seeing both of them used so heavily. So it's check out this chart. And uh, this is uh, a, a tool that Josh ADHD, one of the guys, the second episode of my behind the scenes of fantasy football industry, uh, which is up on my channel. You can check my playlist for that one. He came on and he's the guy who actually built this tool for fantasy insiders. What you can do is go to fantasy insiders, best ball ADP, and you can plug in two players and look at their ADP over a given time period to see how they've been moving. And you're seeing that Royce Freeman has gone up like 15 picks since the preseason started and Devontae Booker is falling back like 15 picks. So I think Booker is being super undervalued for a guy who is splitting the work here. And if, if anything happens to either of the guys, the other one takes over as a high-end RB2. Obviously, Freeman has more of the upside there, right? If Booker were hurt, Freeman's going to get 20 touches a game and be an RB1. 
if uh, Freeman were to get hurt, then Booker would probably be just a high end two because I don't think they're going to give him 25 carries a game. But I do like him later in drafts if you end up going wide receiver heavy and are looking for upside plays. So Booker's a guy I like as well as Freeman. So we'll move over to Seattle where Russell Wilson basically played the entire first half. He went 13 for 21, 193 yards. One guy to point out here. And I've been taking this guy in a ton of my best ball drafts at like the last rounds, which I'm pretty happy that I have now because it's kind of not paying off, but we've seen him do some good things in the preseason. This is Jerron Brown, formerly of the Arizona Cardinals. If you owned John Brown, I'm talking about Jerron Brown. If you own John Brown, then you absolutely know who Jerron Brown is because every time his box score pops up and you're like, Jerron Brown or Jay Brown scored a touchdown, you're like, let's fucking go, LF, fucking G. And then you realize it's Jerron Brown and you're like, shit, bro, shit. Well, this is Jerron Brown. So we look at Seattle, we have Doug Baldwin banged up with the knee. We don't really know his status, to be honest with you, other than they're saying he's going to be good for week one. I don't really trust these injury reports where they're super vague, so we'll have to see. Obviously, Jimmy Graham and Paul Richardson are out of Seattle. There's just not a lot of depth here. Um, there's Lockett, who is in line to be the wide receiver too, but again, he's never really played a huge sample size. He's never played like a role where he's seen a ton of volume. You have Brandon Marshall here, who's like 242 years old, and I have absolutely zero confidence in him regaining even like 50% of the player that he once was. So the positions are up for grabs here, man. Volume is up for grabs, and we saw that Jerron Brown is a really good fit for a guy like Russell Wilson. Um, he showed off his athleticism. He showed off his skill set in this preseason game where he caught a 29-yard pass as well as a 45-yarder from Wilson. And you look at Wilson's a guy who, you know, scrambles out and he makes plays downfield to players who can make plays downfield. And when you look at Jerron Brown on player profiler, his profile comes out very, very favorable, right? His best comparable player is Marvin Jones. He's a guy at 6'2", 205, so he's big, right? He's got size, 4'4", 40, speed, which is 85th percentile speed score in terms of weight adjusted, catch radius, agility score, all over 80th percentile, spark score, 80th, 87th percentile spark score, man. So he's a guy who's being super undervalued. Again, I'm not like telling you to draft him in 10-team in leagues or anything like that. Um, but he's someone to keep an eye on. If you're in deeper leagues, you can definitely do worse than having high upside guy like Jerron Brown. The last game I want to touch on is the 49ers and the Texans. Kind of a lot to talk about here. So we got Jimmy. Jimmy, as Evan Silva likes to call him, Jimmy Field Goal. Jimmy FG, because he settled for so many damn field goals over the final five games of last year. Might need to kind of switch it up and call him Jimmy TD from now on, man. He looked good. He looked, the man's looked good. I think he threw, let me see, 136 yards, 10 to 12 passing, and a score. And all of the reports about this connection between Jimmy G and Marquise Goodwin are coming to fruition. Goodwin has been the clear wide receiver one here. I can't believe people are still, like, people still are high on Pierre Garçon. It blows my mind. But uh, Marquise Goodwin has been the clear wide receiver one, making plays down the field, which are uh, coincided with all the reports that we've heard out of training camp. He had another 40-yard catch from Jimmy G. He caught, like, three passes, I think, for 60-something yards. So you're seeing him getting very involved in this offense. Um, his ADP has been shooting up over the recent weeks. I looked at it, and um, over the last month, from July 20th to August 20th, he's gone from pick 85 up a full 20 spots to pick 65. That is a, a pretty big um, pretty big boost for a wide receiver like that. Uh, I'm definitely okay targeting Goodwin at pick 65. I think if he starts moving up, though, I'd probably put the cutoff around the sixth round. I'm not really looking to grab him in the fifth round or anything like that. It's, I still think like George Kittle has not been playing in the preseason right now. Um, they're pass catching back in terms of like McKinnon and Breida aren't playing right now. So as good as Goodwin has looked, um, he's definitely not a guy I'm avoiding by any means. Don't take don't take this the wrong way. I uh, I, I don't want to draft him if his ADP gets too high, but where it is currently, I'm definitely okay with it. Um, he's not someone I'm, I'm going out and targeting in every one of my drafts, but he's definitely someone that I will own. Uh, hopefully, I will own one or two shares of of him on my in my uh, redraft league. So um, I, I do like Mark. He's a good one. And then we look at the 49ers backfield. It's an absolute mess. We have Jarek McKinnon with his calf strain, uh, which will sign sideline him at least until week one. Backup Matt Breida injured his shoulder, faces the same fate. At least week one is when he'll return. Now we have Joe Williams, the guy that people for some reason keep liking to hype up. I have literally no faith. I don't even know if he's going to make the team now. He fractured his rib in their last game, and he's, pro he's out until at least week one, if not further, probably further. Um, from what the reports are saying. So they bring in Alfred Morris, who obviously had that the, those career years with Kyle Shanahan in Washington as a, as a running back. But Morris, you know, Morris is kind of old. He actually played really, really well last year in Dallas. So I don't want to write Morris off. But they also have this kid, Jeremy McNichols, who was a favorite of the draft Twitter community last summer um, when he was picked. He ended up falling pretty far in the draft. People liked his three-down skill set. 
He got drafted by the Bucks, then got cut, which I don't put any... Take that with a grain of salt, considering I just think the Bucks have no idea what the fuck they're doing over there. He gets cut. Now, he was running with the first team in this preseason game because everyone was out. He was a starter. Touched the ball 13 times, um, which is something to absolutely keep an eye on. But, I mean, they still are obviously looking at McKinnon as the guy to go to here, man. Cons don't forget about the money that they gave him. They want him to be the guy here. Uh, what scares me, though, I am absolutely moving him back in my rankings because of this calf injury. Um, now, he's expected to be ready for week one. However, you know, when I was talking to Dr. Jesse Morse, he was talking about how the calf is, uh, he, has, he has a calf sprain. It's not like a too serious of a calf sprain, but if players come back from it too early, um, it, it can be very tricky and very high probability of re-injury, as well as um, sometimes it can feel good. Like if you're just walking or, you know, jogging or something, you might not feel the pain and you're not going to know exactly how it's going to hold up until you're actually out there and cutting and running and sprinting really hard on it. So it's an injury that has a high uh, probability of re-injuring itself, even if you think you're fully healthy, but you might not be. So for that reason, McKinnon has dropped um, pretty far in my rankings, and I'm definitely out on him as a third-round pick in terms of where his ADP is right now. Houston, Deshaun Watson has looked good. I still stand by the fact that there's no fucking shot on picking him as quarterback two or in the top 50. Uh, Lamar Miller has been playing in almost every snap with the first team, and he looks pretty good according to to what I've seen, and I've watched his runs because he's a guy that I'm intrigued by this year. Someone in the fifth round, um, sometimes I've seen him go in the sixth round, that you can get that's going to be pretty much the featured back here in Houston, guys. If you can get Lamar Miller in the fifth or sixth round, I would absolutely implore you to make that draft pick. He's lost a little bit of weight. He looks like his wiggle's a lot better. He's going to catch a ton of balls. He's going to get the majority of the work in this first-team offense, and it's going to be a pretty good offense. They have a really, really, really good strength of schedule, which plays towards the, the running side of this offense. And since Bill O'Brien took over in Houston, right, the first three years he was there, they were top six in team rushing attempts. Um, and their defense was very good, and that's clearly like what they want their game plan to be. They weren't able to do it last year because their defense was horrible, a ton of injuries and, and things like that. But I'm still I'm very high on Lamar Miller for the, the team entirely as a defense um, and like win loss record to bounce back. So that really wraps it up for the week two preseason uh, recap, my friends. And I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, please give it a thumbs up if you did. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're going to do recaps after each week as well as a ton of videos in between. If you're listening via podcast, please leave a rating and review. I would very, very, very much appreciate that. Subscribe to the channel if you're new, and I'll see you all tomorrow for the top players to avoid video at the wide receiver, Paul Deschamps. Peace.